Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all our attendees around the world. Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by the Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Working Group of the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition. Today, we will be focusing on COVID-19 research priorities in maternal, reproductive, and child health. Our panelists who work within maternal, reproductive, and child health will present their research conducted in this field, and they will identify key research questions that remain still unanswered as we enter the second year of the COVID-19 pandemic. First, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Sofia Salas from the Center for Bioethics at the Faculty of Medicine, Clinica Alemana, Universidad del Desarrollo in Santiago, Chile, where I teach bioethics at the pre and postgraduate level and also participate as member of our local IRB. I also, I am a member of the coalition's ethics and the maternal newborn and child health working groups. I will be co-chairing this webinar with Dr. Jacqueline Ayer, who is a parasitologist working in the Department of Clinical Laboratory at the University Hospital in Tegucigalpa, which is the main public health hospital in Honduras. She's also a faculty member of the research unit, Faculty of Medical Science on the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Honduras. I will give you some brief information on the coalition. This webinar is organized by the COVID-19 Clinical Research Coalition's Maternal, Newborn and Child Health Working Group, hosting by the DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. This coalition was formed in April of 2020 by clinical researchers and scientists in response to their growing concern about the impact of COVID-19 on health systems around the world and that the COVID-19 related research priorities of low resource settings could not be adequately supported or prioritized. The coalition somehow leveraged global expertise to advance high impact COVID-19 research in low resource settings through its 13 expert working groups. Advocates on the issues of concerns to its members, promotes open sharing of research knowledge and data, and champions equitable and affordable access to the vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments proven to be effective. You're welcome to find more information about our working group on the coalition's website. And we'll also post the link to our working group webpage in the chat. We are looking to expand our working group's membership. So if you or any other colleague would like to join us, you'll also find the link on the webpage and in the chat here. Regarding today's agenda, I am delighted that we have four panelists from UK, Dr. Melanie Elti, from South Africa, Dr. Kate Webb, from India, Professor Pravin Kumar, and from Brazil, Dr. Maria Laura Costa, who will chair this webinar with Jacqueline Alder as one of the co-chairs. Following uh, their expertise is at the intersection of clinical practice, research, and public health. And they have worked in a range of contexts Following their panel presentations, there will be a 15 minute Q&A session laid by our co-chair, Dr. Jacqueline Alder, and featuring the members of our working room as well. We strongly encourage all attendees to engage with us and with each other through a Q&A function. You can also use the chat function if you want to say hello or 
put some link that could be of interest to any other attendees. Some housekeeping announcements, just a few ones. Uh, you have to know that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted later on the Coalition website. As I told you, Q&A tool is at the bottom of your screen. And sometimes you can upvote people's question by clicking the thumbs up icon so that we can choose those questions that are more voted. Um, please, if you want to address a question to one of the speakers in particular, please be sure to include the speaker's name with your question. And as I told you previously, the chat function will also be open throughout the session for comments and other interactions throughout the presentations, but only use the Q&A if you would like to ask a specific question to the speakers. I would like now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Melanie Etty. Dr. Melanie Etty is a clinical research fellow in pediatric infectious diseases and microbiology in UK. And she's one of the coordinators of the MCH group, working group. She recently worked in Kampala, Uganda, under the supervision of the Maternal Newborn and Child Working Group co-chair, Professor Chris Kisteledor, to set up the study Pericovid Africa, which aimed to describe the seroepidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 among the pregnant population in five sub-Saharan African countries, Gambia, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, and Uganda. Today, Dr. Eti will be presenting us the results of her study, COVID-19 Research Priorities in Maternal, Reproductive, and Child Health, Results of an International Survey. She has 12 minutes. Dr. Eti, time is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Sophia. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, so as Sophia mentioned, my name is Melanie and I'm a clinical research fellow working for the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Research Group here in, in London at St. George's University, previously based in Uganda, but currently um, based in the UK. And I'm also coordinator of the Maternal Newborn and Child Health Working Group. So today I just wanted to talk about the results of um, an international survey that our working group conducted at the end of last year, um, looking at research priorities in maternal, reproductive and child health. So as Sophia has mentioned, one of the main objectives of the coalition is championing high impact research. And there are a significant number of unanswered questions relating to COVID-19 and its effects in pregnant women, um, pregnant and breastfeeding women and children. And to date, a lot of the data that we have um, is from research that's conducted in high income nations, producing data that may not be general, generalizable or uh, relevant to the needs of uh, researchers and clinicians in resource limited settings. So we set about trying to set priorities in this domain, research priorities in this domain. And it was important to us that the priorities were equitable, internationally representative, and also reflective of the perceived priorities across, across specialties and across different regions of, of, around the world. So in doing so, we, we set about creating a questionnaire and we, use the mod modified Delphi approach. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. And so we created a questionnaire, two questionnaires that we disseminated um, and we disseminated those in English, French and Spanish. We disseminated our first questionnaire in October, 2020. We created a short list of 17 research priorities through literature review and also through expert input during our um, our working group meet, um, meetings. And we asked respondents to the questionnaire to select the five most important priorities in their opinion out of the short list of 17. We collected the questionnaire data and we looked at the frequency of 
um, of selection of each of the research priorities. And the seven least chosen priorities were eliminated from the list. We then recirculated the 10 remaining priorities to our previous list of respondents and asked them to, to rank the priorities on this occasion from most to least important, with one being the most important priority in their opinion and 10 being the least important priority. We then again collected the, um, the research data and then we calculated the average ranking for each priority with a lower number or a lower score indicating a higher priority and a higher score indicating a lower priority overall. So just looking at the results, so we received a number of responses to our initial questionnaire. We received 225 responses and our respondents were based in 29 countries across five continents. From our recirculated questionnaire, we had a slightly lower response rate, 49 responses out of 173. Um, and we postulated that that may have been been because the timing of the dissemination of the questionnaire may have coincided with an increased burden of, of cases around the world, which may have possibly led to lower engagement. And just looking at the respondent demographics, so we have quite a large South, Central and South American contingent within our um, working group at the moment. And so it's probably no surprise that the majority of our responses were in Spanish and from um, from researchers and clinicians in Central and South America. There was a fairly equal number of, of obstetric and gynecology and pediatric respond, respondents, which was very important to us given um, the nature of our questionnaire and the uh, responses that we wanted. Um, but we also had responses from um, clinicians and researchers within sexual and reproductive health, um, midwives and nurses, infectious diseases, public health specialty um, specialists and epidemiologists, which I think was also important in terms of increasing the diversity of the responses that we received. So I've just highlighted the most frequently selected research priorities according to questionnaire language, a respondent specialty and respondent location just to really highlight the importance of the responses that we received and actually that we already at the, um, after questionnaire one started to see that there was a great degree of consensus among, among what was deemed the most important priority. So here by, by language, we can see that among our English, French and Spanish respondents, access to healthcare was a, a very highly ranked priority as well as understanding the direct impact of the COVID-19 um, of COVID-19 on pregnant and breastfeeding um, populations as well as infants and children. And then again here looking by location we, we're still seeing similar themes so access to healthcare being an important factor, the direct impact of the SARS-CoV-2 Two virus on these populations, and also looking at indirect impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the pandemic response on these populations. And then again, if we look at the specialties, a breakdown by specialties, we're seeing the same similar responses, I should say. And if I just move to highlight the responses, so again, we're seeing a lot of the same priorities, access to healthcare being very important, direct impact of the virus on these populations and the indirect impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, on these populations being important themes. And then just looking at the average research priority rankings that we calculated based on the responses to questionnaire two, I think the first thing to highlight is that there was not a great degree of difference between the highest ranked priority and our lowest ranked priority. Um, and yet again, so I can just highlight, we're seeing similar themes again in the responses that we received. So access to healthcare being a very important topic understanding the direct impact of the COVID-19, um, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, I should say, on these populations, again, being very important, and understanding the indirect effects of the pandemic on these populations, um, also featuring very highly, and also understanding 
transmission among these populations and um, how protection against the disease um, is important in these populations. And so that led us really to identify four key research priority themes. And I'll go through those and also the questions that we have highlighted as being extremely important within each of these domains. So firstly, theme one, so access to healthcare. And this is particularly important in terms of access for vulnerable groups. Um, so migrant populations, transient populations and populations particularly in resource limited areas. And we also considered access in terms of overcoming barriers to access. So it was very important for us and from, for some respondents to, that, to our questionnaire to understand how pregnant and breastfeeding women can gain greater access to COVID-19 vaccine trials. And that was another priority that featured very highly in our questionnaire responses. The direct effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on pregnant women, infants and children was another very highly um, ranked research priority. And I think it's really important that we understand the effects, not only the short-term effects of the virus on these populations, but also the long-term effects. And we're very grateful to have Kate Webb on the call today, who's going to talk about um, multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome in children, which is um, a poorly elucidated phenomenon, but another important aspect when thinking about COVID-19 and its effects in children. Then the indirect effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on children, and there have been a lot of societal changes that have occurred as a result of lockdown measures that have been needed to, to prevent the spread of disease. And it will be interesting to know how that affects the, the health of pregnant and breastfeeding women and children going forward. For example, disruptions to um, routine immunization schedules, how will that affect um, Vac the rates of vaccine preventable diseases going forward and how have disruptions to schooling, how will that affect childhood development going forward? I think these are important questions, not only for the now, but also for the future. And also understanding the transmission of the, um, the disease and also protection from infection. So understanding the routes through which uh, the virus can be transmitted from mother to child um, and also how immunity can be transmitted from mother to child, whether there is transplacental transfer of antibodies, whether that confers pr protection for the newborn. These are all important questions that I think we are starting to answer and will continue to answer in this coming year. So there were some limitations um, in the work that we had conducted. As I mentioned before, Central and South America was overrepresented among our questionnaire respondents, and there was a fairly low response rate to questionnaire two. And also, using a survey method limited the depth of our response, the responses received. But I think there were also some benefits. Um, we can certainly start to align the results of our work with other research priorities identified in different. Um, research priority setting exercises such as that uh, undertaken by the World Health Organization and there may this may form the basis for future work through focus groups and semi-structured interviews to yield more varied responses and also this is a very dynamic process it's it may be that the research priorities that were previously identified may not be relevant um, you know in months to come and so this is a um, a realm, a process, sorry, that should be constantly repeated and updated. So just to conclude, so our results actually demonstrated a great degree of consensus among different regions and specialties, but it was important that we use an approach that, that sought to identify differences um, among, among these different groups. Um, and we hope that these research priority themes will help to focus the discussion, particularly in relation to allocating limited resources for future COVID-19 research in maternal, reproductive and child health. And we also hope that this work will help to foster deeper international research collaboration. And certainly we're always very keen within our working group to hear from researchers um, around the world to see how we can support them in the work that they're doing. Um, so we would be very grateful if you could reach out to us and we can see how we can help with that. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to all of the members of the um, uh, our working group. 
um, for all of their help in helping put this project together. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for listening. Thanks, Mel, for your wonderful presentation. We'll move now to our second speaker, Dr. Kate Webb. Dr. Webb is a pediatric rheumatologist and laboratory immunologist based in Cape Town, South Africa. She led the first large data confirmation of the sex bias in COVID-19, which was published in Nature Communication and has initiated research on the new multisystem immune syndrome in children by recruiting these cases and publishing the first case series from Africa in the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. She has set up a national uh, MISC group, working group, and has been part of the international response to this disease by performing a meta-analysis of laboratory cases for the WHO Guidelines Development Group. She will present her findings about multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children in South Africa. Your 12 minutes, Kate. Hello, thank you very much for having me and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, let me just click over. So um, my name is Kate Webb, and as mentioned, I'm a pediatric rheumatologist from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and I'd like to talk about our experience with MISC or MIS um, in South Africa, and what I think some of the, the research priorities are for globally and for less developed countries going forward with MISC. So this, this is a paper that was published um, in July of 2020, documenting the emergence of MISC throughout the world. The first cases emerged in the UK in April of 2020, and these cases were then rapidly described throughout Europe um, and the US as the pandemic pro progressed across the world. Um, in South Africa, we started to see our first cases in early June of 2020, and we were able to publish our first um, uh, description of the first 20 cases in South Africa by August of 2020 and that was between the two centers in the Western Cape which which was really where the pandemic first emerged in, in our country and spread throughout the rest of the country. The WHO along with the CDC and the Royal College of um, Physicians and Child Health um, or Pediatricians and Child Health uh, Practitioners released consensus definitions or criteria or definitions of cases within 2020 um, and the WHO highlighted that these were young people who had fever for three days, along with the other features like the rash and the mucocutaneous findings um, and the conjunctivitis, the profound hypotension and profound myocardial involvement, as well as elevated inflammatory markers and evidence of inflammation. What was useful about the WHO criteria at the time is that it it, it, it required evidence of COVID-19, either through a positive PCR or an antibody test, but they also included likely contact with patients with COVID-19, which was really useful for those of us who had no access to antibody testing at the time. Um, the cases were noted to peak on average about four weeks after the peak of cases emerged in a country. So the top graph is for the United Kingdom and the bottom is for the United States. So it was through this kind of pattern that people started to talk about or think about how this was re related temporarily to COVID-19. Um, and these are the latest US data that were published in April of this year. Um, speaking, I think these are the uh, 1,700 cases up until the end of January 2021. And you can see the pattern of cases that emerged. We've seen a similar pattern in South Africa or, or locally in my hospital at least. And I'll show you that we had a lot of cases with the first wave and we're not sure whether there's issues with data keeping or reporting but we seem to have seen fewer cases as we're going along but we're not sure whether this is a global phenomenon what the us and others have reported that i think is quite important is that um, from early on we saw that this so, so these are us data reporting 1700 children and there's a disproportionate amount of children who are of non-hispanic black ethnicity or race um, which has been reported from the UK and the US that this disproportionately tends to affect these children, which made us particularly vigilant in South Africa to expect that we may see um, high numbers of cases going forward. 
MISC became a notifiable condition in South Africa in September 2020, but through this mechanism, we've only had 75 cases um, formally notified, so we're really working hard to try and improve our notification system. But we rapidly set up a national working group for MISC, and just anecdotally, we know of at least 175 cases throughout the tertiary care centres within South Africa, and we expect that this number should be much higher um, given that we don't have good national reporting yet. Provincially, where I work in the Western Cape of South Africa, um, which is a relatively well-resourced uh, province, we have two main tertiary pediatric referral centers, the Red Cross Children's Hospital and Tigerberg Hospital. And between the two of us, we had seen 65 cases until the end of March, 2021. Um, from the Red Cross Children's Hospital in South Africa, we've seen 40 MISC cases. Um, up until the end of February um, and these children start off at about six years of age um, and, and these are similar data to, to what we're seeing in the rest of the world. What is important with these cases is that 57% of these children have no contact with anyone who has been unwell in the last in the last two months within their house and very few have a confirmed COVID contact and only four out of ten of these children were PCR positive when we tested them initially. We've subsequently confirmed that on their presentation, the serum that we had taken did contain antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. So we have confirmed that diagnosis. Um, treatment, oh, sorry, we've, we've admitted 15 out of these 40 children to our ICU, which is in line with the data from the rest of the world, where approximately half of children are requiring ICU. And the majority of these admissions are for, um, for the shock and requiring inotropic support but a fair amount of these children do require ventilation and dialysis. Um, treatment for these children has, has been based anecdotally or, or, or kind of consensus based on the phenotypic similarity to Kawasaki disease when these cases first emerged. So IVIG has been used universally almost in these kids where it is available. And that's one of the big problems we think with treatment is that IVIG is very expensive and is not universally available um, in, in the less developed world. Our children have mostly received IVIG, 97% uh, of them have, one child didn't receive IVIG, and some mix of IVIG and methylprednisolone. So the children who tended to have shock or require ICE, we also gave methylprednisolone to, and very few of our children have required escalation to a biologic therapy, and these were actually only in the first wave for 10% for of the children, four out of the 40 required tocilizumab and IL-6 inhibitor. These children tend to do very well once, once their inflammation gets under control um, and their CRP responds adequately and comes down to normal in the majority of them. Um, there's only been one retrospective study of um, drug efficacy in SARS-CoV-2, and these are data that emerged from France, a nationwide study in France, a retrospective uh, a study looking, uh, uh, controlling for the severity, so matching these these cases with a propensity score for severity and they compared children who'd received IVIG and methylprednisolone to children who had received IVIG alone and I think what we're really what we'd really like to see is compared to children who'd received methylprednisolone alone so there was some evidence that in terms of treatment failure as defined by persistence of fever two days after treatment that the combination was better than giving IVIG alone with the caveat that these are retrospective and not clinical trial data. So looking at which clinical trials and ongoing MISC studies are going on, very early on, a group at Imperial formed the Best Available Treatment Study, which is an online study gathering data from across the world so people can upload case data onto this um, based on the treatments that are available within their center. So within these data, we should be able to see if there's any signal for those places that may only have had oral prednisolone available or IV methylprednisolone or IVIG available. Um, so we are expecting to see some retrospective data from that, that trial soon. The recovery trial, which is a large platform-based trial in the UK, which was set up to rapidly evaluate in a flexible manner uh, treatments for COVID-19 in adults, has now included a, a pediatric arm for MISC or PIMS as they call it in the UK. And this has two randomizations. The first is to IVIG versus methylprednisolone, and the second is to anakinra versus tocilizumab. The recovery trial is UK based, but we're looking at setting up sister sites in South Africa, and there's a sister site in Switzerland, and we're looking at developing one in, in South America. 
to um, try and assess, to, to gather numbers from across the world. Um, and then the other question really is to look at long-term outcomes after MISC. And there's one study that I know of happening in the NIH in the UK, US. So I think in my last minute, I just want to go through my last slide. The research questions that I think personally are important in MISC. There are very few data regarding the prevalence of MISC in the developing world, in Africa and less developed countries. So I, I feel that as, as COVID becomes controlled in other nations due to vaccinations, this has a real risk of becoming a disease that, that we see more commonly in places like Africa. And we really need to understand what to look for and what the burden of diseases that we can expect. The diagnostic criteria are currently consensus-based. And I feel like we need diagnostic or studies looking at comparative to conditions. So not just COVID, but things like typhoid and TB and appendicitis, which is the things that we've been grappling with in diagnosing these children to assess the sensitivity and specificity of the diagnostic criteria. We urgently need prospective clinical trials, not just of biologic drugs, but of accessible treatments that are available to children in, all, all over the world. We need to understand the underlying immune cause of MISC, and we urgently need to support basic science research into MISC um, so that we can determine the best treatments going forward. We need to think about what the, um, or understand a little bit more about the immunology of MISC so that we can postulate on what the vaccinations could, whether they may or may not influence MISC. It's currently unknown whether MISC is inducible through vaccination. We are not sure. We, we think that vaccination will help to control COVID and, and therefore decrease the incidence of MIC, but that's something that's not yet known. And we also need to find out why some children are more susceptible to MIC. We need to, to see if we can establish risk factors or genetic susceptibilities in these children. Thank you. Thanks, Gweb, for your wonderful presentation. We'll move on, on to the third speaker, Professor Praveen Kumar. Professor Kumar is a neonatologist at the Tertiary Care Referral Center in North India and honorary member of the American Pediatric Society. He ha has a special interest in quality improvement and patient safety and led the development of evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for newborn care in India, including the Joint Clinical Practice Guidelines on Perinatal Neonatal Management of COVID-19. The title of his presentation is COVID-19 in India, Pregnancy, Neonates, and Children. Professor Kumar, your next 12 minutes. Thank you, Sophia, and thank you to all the coalition members, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do is present to you a bit of uh, research as well as a bit of experience what our professional bodies have done in India. So all of you know already that India has been facing a very devastating second wave, which has been nearly four times in magnitude compared to the first wave. But thankfully we are now in the declining phase and situation seems to be much better. So the first big question is whether children have been affected disproportionately in second wave versus the first wave. So this is data shared by the Indian Council of Medical Research. Uh, what it shows is that the proportion of less than 20 years old affected has been consistently below 12%, both in first wave and second wave. If you were to look at only the hospitalized patients, then there's a marginal increase from 4.2% to 5.8% in this age group. Uh, this is in contrast to nearly 35% of the population being constituted by this age group. So basically, there is an increase in the absolute numbers because of the large magnitude of the wave, but I don't think as a proportion, it has really mattered much. Now, what has happened to the pregnant woman? Uh, this is data sharing from my own institute from the obstetric colleagues. Uh, what you can see as compared to the first wave, the positivity for the RT-PCR test amongst pregnant women increased from 5% to 19%. And the proportion of asymptomatic women who were positive came down from 93% to 42%. And similarly, those with moderate to severe symptoms increased substantially from 1.5% to 19%. So basically telling us that pregnant women in this wave have been particularly more affected and same experience has been shared with me by my colleagues from all across other cities of India. 
Now, our professional body, the National Unitology Forum, in collaboration with the obstetric body as well as the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, uh, in fact, in last year in March, came out with a clinical practice guideline for managing the pregnant woman as well as the newborns. Uh, this guideline was subsequently updated in May 20, and it followed the grade methodology which has been recommended by WHO, which means the evidence was reviewed and it was combined with the values and preferences of all stakeholders, the resources which might be required, and based on that, the practice recommendations were provided. Uh, in fact, because of the rigor of methodology, this guideline was rated amongst the top guideline amongst the 17 international guidelines which were reviewed last year in an article published in ECTA Pediatrica. And right now, we are in the process of updating this guideline to version 3, which should be available in the next 7 to 10 days. Uh, both these professional bodies, the neonatology and the obstetric body, have been uh, very pro proactive and advocated for the inclusion of pregnant women and neonates in the testing guideline published by the government of India. And as a result, in September last year, both pregnant women and newborns were included in that particular testing strategy. Uh, the National Neonatology Forum also launched a specific neonatal COVID registry last year in the month of March, uh, in which it was a voluntary participation by both private and public sector hospitals. And uh, this guide, so registry site is able to give a real-time update about what is happening to the data. And all the members are able to see in graphical form the, you know, the number of babies or mothers who have been enrolled, the percentage breastfeeding, the percentage roomed in, and the overall outcomes as well as the respiratory support required. Similar registries were created by the obstetric bodies as well as the pediatric bodies. So data from this registry was published in one of the Indian Pediatrics Journal uh, a couple of months ago. And this basically reflects the first wave. And there were inbuilt checks for ensuring the quality of data as well as ensuring the uh, security of data that remains encrypt encrypted. So we had both intramural or inborn units as well as extramural or outborn units. And as you can see, there were 1589 intramural units and 122 extramural or the outborn units. And I would summarize the results of this registry in the next slide. So basically, we tried to answer three questions. Uh, so we could see that perinatal transmission, which means transmission within first 72 hours of life, happened in 8% of the babies, whereas transmission after 72 hours of life happened in 1.5% of the inborn babies. The mode of delivery and breastfeeding were not associated with any increased risk. However, there was a marginal increased risk of transmission if the baby was roomed in with the mother with relative risk of 1.16. We believe this was related to possibly incomplete compliance with the guidelines for protection. The babies who were, born, who were positive were more likely to be born premature, were more likely to require resuscitation, and more likely to be symptomatic with respiratory distress and other neonatal morbidities. But most of the symptoms and signs were basically, which were normally you would see in preterm babies or due to perinatal illnesses. There was only an occasional baby who would present it with COVID pneumonia. There was no increase in mortality. Amongst the 122 outbound babies, uh, we could see about one third were positive for the RT-PCR. And amongst them, around 50% were symptomatic. And rest 50% were diagnosed basically as part of the pre-surgical workup or pre-investigation workup. Uh, we all are aware of the collateral damage which occurred due to non-availability of uh, routine care facilities. And one such publication from Northern India looked at the incidence of stillbirth and found that in during the lockdown period, as compared to the previous year, the stillbirth rate went up. And most commonly, this was due to modifiable or preventable causes of stillbirth, basically delays in reaching the hospital or delays in timely availability of care once the patient reached, reaches the hospital. We also produced several infographics to help our colleagues in smaller towns and smaller cities to supplement the clinical practice guideline. So for example, infographic for how to organize the services for COVID patients in the newborn units, an infographic for how to organize resuscitation in the labor room in a safe but effective manner, and then also how to ensure that breast milk is provided to all these newborns irrespective of the maternal condition or the maternal status and the location. 
Another last bit I would share is the interesting findings uh, because there have been also collateral gains because of several things which happened. And I think because of the rigorous infection control measures, we were actually able to see a drop in the normal bacterial infection rates. So this data belongs to my unit and we compared the uh, infection rates during the lockdown period amongst newborns versus the immediate previous period compared to the lockdown and also a corresponding period in the pre-COVID year. And we could see there was a dramatic drop in the incidence of culture positive sepsis. And interestingly, we were able to demonstrate a uh, significant decrease in the incidence of multi-drug resistant organisms, especially Acinetobacter baumeni, which was very, very difficult to eradicate otherwise. But in this period, we were able to virtually get rid of this organism. So that was an interesting finding. And I believe this was related to more rigor in implementing the infection control measures. So what is happening currently? Yes, we are, we are seeing a lot of uh, children with multisystem inflammatory syndrome and occasional newborn who has been diagnosed with MIS. Uh, luckily, the mucormycosis, which is now rampant in the adult population, uh, have not been seen so much in children. There's an occasional odd case only. Uh, the, the COVID vaccination has been opened for lactating women. And the pregnant women also have, have an option if they want to take the vaccine. And in children, a trial is going to start next month to work out whether children will be safe enough to receive this vaccine. Uh, currently, there's a lot of talk and discussion going on about preparation for third wave. And there is some kind of uh, thing going on that maybe children may be more affected. So all the state government, central government, and all the organizations are really working on it, trying to augment the capacities for pediatric care. And the uh, kind of uh, thought is that even if it doesn't come, it's better to be prepared and it will help us to augment the care for the children in general. So thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. And uh, we are going to move to our last speaker, Dr. Maria Laura Costa. She's an associate professor with the Department of OBGYN of the State University of Campinas in Brazil. Dr. Costa has a broad research portfolio on different aspects of obstetric care, including audit feedback techniques to enhance guideline-based care, maternal morbidity and near misses, and translational science of preeclampsia, Zika virus, and COVID-19. The title of her presentation is Impact of COVID-19 in Brazil, and the consequences on pregnancy, the Rebraco Initiative. Dr. Costa, you are 12 minutes now. So thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to share a few of the results and the experience within research in Brazil. So again, I'm Laura Costa, and I'm a clinician also working at a university hospital in the southeast of Brazil. And I'll talk a little bit about a multi-center study uh, in our country involving 16 maternity hospitals. It's called Hebraco. In Portuguese, that means network of uh, maternities in COVID during pregnancy. I'm sure all of you have seen a few of these headings in the newspapers worldwide because Brazil also had a very intense pandemic throughout the country. We are a country of continental size with a lot of disparity in social and economical uh, differences among regions. I'll go through a little bit of our numbers. These are numbers from last week. So overall, we had more than 15 million confirmed cases, over 430,000 deaths. And uh, pregnant women are a vulnerable group since the beginning in Brazil. If we look at the numbers of maternal deaths from last week, they are impressive over um, around 1,099. So very early in the pandemic, everyone was pretty much worried about the risks of the COVID-19 in pregnant women, considering our previous experience in other 
uh, respiratory infections such as influenza. However, initial reports such as this example from CDC with data from the US initially presented a low maternal uh, mortality rate similar to non-pregnant. However, it did show that pregnant women were at increased risks for severity with more intensive care unit admission and more need for ventilatory support. So what was different in Brazil from the beginning? And there is lack of data from under-resourced setting as we have talked about in previous presentations. So Brazil had from the beginning, and this is data from the national surveillance system, a increased number of maternal deaths. And then we could easily point some delays since around 20% of women who died were not admitted to an ICU and only around 60% uh, had ventilatory support. Not only that, this study showed that there was increased death among Black women. So early on in the pandemic, we decided to put a group together that has been working in network uh, in Brazil in studies in maternal mortality, morbidity, and preterm birth to now study different aspects of COVID during pregnancy and postpartum. So this initiative um, is, as I said, 16 maternity hospitals in four regions of Brazil, most of the centers in the southeast, and with even the possibility of spreading to a few places in, um, in Latin America and Africa. We do have a broad study that intends not only to see prevalence with a cross-sectional approach, and I'll show you a little bit of that, a cohort of suspected cases to look at maternal and perinatal results, a study in biological samples to look at vertical transmission and mechanisms of infection, and also a qualitative approach and an ecological approach to look at different outcomes before and during the pandemic. Unfortunately, due to time restriction, I won't go through our results in the studies with biological sample collection, but we can certainly talk more about this in uh, the discussion. What I wanted to talk more is on preparation and how maternities face the pandemic. I think we always talk a lot about the disease, the severity, but there's a uh, little uh, about how maternities prepare. So until 31 July, in the centers considered, we had 310 confirmed cases of COVID, 30 maternal deaths, half of them due to COVID-19. And I want to go through this uh, figure with you to show that each bar represents one of our maternities. The initial point of the bar is where the maternity starting, started to prepare for the pandemic, and that means put a group together, protocols, uh, change, ER, OR, increase ICU beds, and so far. The black square is where the maternity had the first confirmed case. Here, the vertical line represents the first confirmed case in Brazil. So I guess you can all see that most of the centers started preparation much before the first case, which is good. Only one center, center number two, um, started preparing before, after the first confirmed case. And the star here presents the only center that could start universal screening for childbirth, so testing all admissions for childbirth, which is an important intervention. And if we look beyond the numbers to what it represented, we can see a lot uh, listening to health managers and the fear of the virus. And I'll read this sentence to you. So early during the outbreak, we had a general feeling of fear that was initially resolved. 
However, when there was no bed available in the city and we started to see people dying, there was a big wave of fear again. And if we take a look at the highlighted sentence here, we can also see the reality in under-resourced settings. So we created rules. We're going to restrict the waterproof aprons to this procedure in this sector. We're going to restrict the use of masks. The mask will have to be used for a given period of time and so on. So many restrictions and difficulties in facing the pandemic inside maternities. And one of the questions we always pose is, so what's the prevalence of COVID among pregnant women and among asymptomatic women? And it is a recommendation here in Brazil through the Ministry of Health to perform universal testing. However, uh, very few centers could do that. If you go through a summary of the results in the literature, of course, the prevalence depends upon the epidemiological condition and can be as high as 20%. In my center, if we compare the worst uh, months in the first wave to the second wave, we can see that overall positive cases of COVID-19 for among women admitted for childbirth went from five to 10% among asymptomatic from less than 2% to around 6%. And we have seen a marked increase in severity of cases in the second wave. And now we know that it is also related to the increase in Vox and variants of concern. And we were able to demonstrate that as well. If we look at a few of our results in our cohort, we were able to um, get information on 729 women with suspected COVID. And then if we go down to the flow chart, we have 289 confirmed COVID cases, 207 and 70 negative cases. And then if we look at our pregnant women, we have data on complete maternal and perinatal results on 374 women. When we compare the clinical features and severity among cases of confirmed COVID and negative COVID, we see that there is increased severity of, among the confirmed cases with increased admission to ICU, intubation, maternal death. And when we look among the positive cases and we compare severe cases to non-SARS cases, we again see that there is increased risk estimate for preeclampsia, and there is a rationale for that since the AC2 receptor plays a role in that, increased risk of, of C-section, and also increased rate of, um, of uh, worse perinatal outcomes. I'll finish with the definition of maternal morbidity, saying that when we discuss our priorities in research, we should always keep in mind that we want women to survive, but also thrive and transform. I thank all my medical residents, residents and my research team, and I'm open for all the questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Maria Laura. And uh, now we will shift into the discussion portion that will be moderated by Dr. Jacqueline Alger, who I presented before at the beginning of this webinar. And we Thank welcome you. our four panelists, Dr. Etty, Dr. Webb, Professor Kuma, and Dr. Costa. And we are willing to uh, receive your question through the Q&A &Q uh, function. Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. We had been having a very active chat and also we had uh, have uh, very interesting questions in the Q&A. So let's see. Uh, there is a, a question for Melanie. Uh, it says, could there have been anything lost in translation when translating the questionnaires? Melanie? 
Yes, so we did consider that when we were planning the questionnaires and we were very fortunate actually that we had native Spanish and French speakers within our working group who helped to translate the questionnaires. Um, for that reason, we did limit the amount of free text um, that could be written in each of the questionnaires and mainly stuck to, um, to um, pre-ascribed questions, so ranking or choosing pre-ascribed already written options. Um, and I highlighted that as being one of the limitations of, our, of the work that we did. It limited the variety of responses, but it did allow for anything, well, did limit the possibility of things being lost in translation. And additionally, for the results or the responses that we had, we did have those translated by our native speakers. Um, but yes, I, I think you're right. It, in our attempts to limit um, the amount that we would have to translate, it did mean that we thus limited the responses. And I just actually, there was another question that I think that um, uh, came into the chat about the real reliability of the data. And I think it is, again, important to highlight that this is, a, it, these questions, they're very dynamic and, you know, over time, these priorities will likely change, and also according to um, the the cohort that is that is approached to answer these questions. So, I think this is an exercise worth worth repeating, and it may be that upon repeating, we get a different set of results. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, here we have a question that could, could be answered for both uh, Dr. Webb and Dr. Kumar. Uh, they said, uh, is there any research that shows exclusive breastfeeding may protect baby from severe COVID-19? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, I can answer that. <laughs> so basically what has been shown that uh, through the breast milk, you can have transmission of antibodies from the mother to the baby, which can be protective. Uh, whatever RNA has been isolated occasionally is non-infective and very low dose. But more important, and also the breast milk would have several anti-inflammatory factors which can help the baby. What is more important is uh, if you look at the survival benefit of breastfeeding per se and compare it with the case fatality of COVID-19, then breastfeeding would outweigh this by several thousand fold. A modeling exercise was published, I think, on 1st of March in Lancet related to Kangaroo Mother Care, where they showed that even if you were to assume 100% transmission rate from mother to baby, Kangaroo Mother Care will offer 65-fold survival benefit compared to the mortality due to COVID. And if the transmission was only 10%, then the benefit is nearly 600-fold like that. So breastfeeding definitely is protective. Kate, would you like to comment? Um, I, that, that's not my area of expertise, so I'm very happy with, with um, Professor Collington. All right, thank you. And uh, there, there are several questions about uh, vaccines. Uh, there is uh, one that uh, I, I will read uh, some of them. Uh, one of them says, what is the most effective way the physician can help patients understand the importance of getting a vaccine. There is another one about uh, well, you, you can go ahead with that one. Uh, um, this is a general, this is a general yes. question. Maybe so, I will. I would like to uh, tell our own experience in Chile. All right, because go ahead. We, we had um, slowing down the rate of vaccination, the speed, and the government announced that those that had completed their vaccines will be allowed to go out without the quarantine. And it increased over 100% the people going to receive their vaccines. So sometimes obtaining more liberty, freedom, uh, is a good incentive for getting the vaccine. Right. I'm not sure if the other 
panelists have other things to share about that? And there is also a specific question about uh, women who are planning in vitro fertilization treatment. If there is any issue with vaccination on pregnant women or women planning in vitro fertilization treatment. Any of you, would you like to comment please? Um, I would like to take that question as well, because we have been working in terms of vaccine, that it was not the main focus mm -hmm. of this webinar. And okay. um, there are some vaccines that are safe to be used in pregnancy. Those are the, the more traditional platforms and also those that use, um, for example, dead virus. It is not recommended those that have on uh, live or attenuated virus, virus to be used during pregnancy. And I would say that after the, the third, the first trimester, there is enough data about safety and efficacy of vaccine after the vaccine are being rolled out in thousands of pregnant women. And regarding those women that want to go to IVF, I would suggest that they get vaccinated first, complete their doses, and then start the IVF procedure just to be uh, safely inoculated. Thank you, Sophia. And Kate, uh, someone is interested in knowing the dose of intravenous immunoglobulin and the, and the duration, how many hours? And um, Thank you, I think that's a great question. So, so we are basing it on the evidence that we have for Kawasaki disease, but um, I think there was another question as well, speaking about Kawasaki. And even though there are definite overlaps in the two syndromes, we do think that these are distinct. Children with MISC tend to be older. They have a much more profound myocardial involvement than children with Kawasaki. Um, so, so the truth is we're not sure of the optimal dose for MIC. We're, we're using two milligrams per kilogram, but in a child who weighs 40 kilograms as compared to an 11 kilogram child with Kawasaki, that's a huge dose of IVIG, an enormous volume, um, and, it's, and it's extremely expensive. So they have the optimal dose. We're we're giving it to these children with with myocardiogen so i think that that's one of the things that we need to spend more time research thank you kate and uh, laura uh, someone would like to note about uh, if you believe there is a geographic relation on this woman so if you mean there is a geographic relation in the outcomes. Yes, for sure. The worst outcomes are in our north and northeast regions, which are the regions with um, more social and economic difficulties. So sure, I guess the effects of the pandemic reflect in places where there is already increased maternal mortality and uh, delays, if I did get the question right. but. And Laura, could you also please uh, comment on uh, giving the adverse pregnancy outcomes due to COVID-19 infection? Would you say the pregnancy and fertility desire of women in Brazil have been affected? And um, do you expect the fertility decline in the country? Um, so I don't have uh, actual research data on that yet. But we are really concerned because many of the primary care facilities are uh, having very restricted um, health care provided and women are seeking for contraception and having limited access. So we're trying to increase the postpartum access, for example, postpartum IUD and the maternities and so on. And we have some reports of increased emergency contraception, probably because those women are not finding effective contraception and uh, gynecological follow-up. 
So that, that is a real concern. And yes, we'll, we'll try to address that. Okay, thank you, Laura. And Dr. Kumar, do you think there could also be other contributing factors to the impressive drop in MDR infections other than increased infection control due to COVID? Yeah, so we don't know. We also have been contemplating, trying to find it out. But other than this particular reason that maybe the infection control, the high touch surface cleaning, hand hygiene was more rigorous, we really have not been able to find any other reason so far. Uh, so I don't know really whether there could be anything else. Yeah. Thank you. Melanie, uh, could you share your views on uh, if the COVID-19 outbreak in less resource settings had a more influence on women accessing reproductive and child health services than the documented barriers to access? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I saw that question from David and I think it's a really important question. And um, in fact, two of our um, working group members who are based at the Karolinska Institute have been very interested in this, um, in this topic and had, had actually conducted a survey. And I'll, I was just looking for the link to that and I'll share that. And that was a survey among uh, migrant populations in Sweden and looking at the effects of the pandemic um, on their ability to access reproductive and maternal health care. And it was reduced. Um, and certainly I haven't seen much data, but my experience of my time in Kampala was that the maternity hospital that I was primarily based at was much less frequently attended by pregnant women and mothers. And I think that whilst it was anecdotal and in my experience, I, I, I think it's most likely the case in other parts of Africa and in other resource limited settings. And so I think it's important that infrastructure is put in place um, to highlight any missed opportunities during those important times for, as I mentioned before, so catch up immunizations and um, increased follow up for babies born during this period to ensure that there are no long lasting effects um, of this reduction in healthcare contact, contact that has likely occurred over the last year. Thank you, Melanie. Your comments uh, also applies to across Latin America. Thank you. Uh, Kate, um, could you please explain if in, in your study, did you find out why black female were more infected? Um, thank you for that question. So yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of um, thought about how there's a disproportionate um, uh, incidence of MISC in certain population groups. Uh, generally, the MISC has been uh, throughout the world has affected boys slightly more frequently than girls. So we certainly seem to be slightly different, but our entire pandemic seems to be slightly different in South Africa in that we're one of the few countries that has higher rates of infections in females than, than males. So I think that that's probably just reflective of that. And we're not sure why that is the case. And we're also not sure exactly why we see differences um, in, it, uh, in certain races being affected by MISC or not. Um, and, and it probably is reflective just of general social inequality and that people of color in South Africa are more likely to be infected by COVID in the first instance. So those are definitely questions that we have to think of and, and perform more research on. And, and, and yeah, we, we don't have the answers for now. Thank you, Kate. Laura, would you please comment on mass screening for COVID-19 for all mothers and utilization of the service? Is the maternal service not decreased because of fear of being tested for COVID-19? So the universal screening and testing for patients admitted for childbirth is implemented in very, very few maternities in Brazil. And it, it is a challenge because you need to have the infrastructure to perform a quick result and to isolate women, even if asymptomatic and uh, for all the sample collection and so on. But in my experience, we have been 
uh, performing universal screening in my uh, university, we had no problems with that. Mothers are actually uh, glad to be tested. We do have some women that delay the information on symptoms because they're, they are scared, but the routine of universal screening for women that are admitted for childbirth and uh, that has been uh, okay. And we really do not have women that do not consent to that. Okay, thank you, Laura. And uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, you mentioned that the next wave would hit uh, children, pediatric population. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I already answered in chat box. So basically, it's uh, I don't think there's any scientific basis. People thought maybe more adults have been infected with natural infection, or maybe more adults are vaccinated, so they will be protected. And hence, children might become more vulnerable. Uh, but uh, zero surveys do not really uh, you know, uh, support that. Zero surveys have shown prevalence to be similar in children as well as the adults. But we are happy that facilities for children are being augmented and that will help in the long run. So we are fine with that. Okay. Um, I'm looking for more questions in the, in the chat. Uh, while uh, see if there are new questions. I, I would like uh, a question or, to Kate. All right. Uh, I saw on your data that you show some racial difference. Were there too many Hispanic cases for South Africa? Oh, I don't see Kate. She's coming back. But oh, yeah. Could you, Sophia, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, yeah, Kate, sorry. can you? Kate, are you No, listening? maybe if she's not uh, there, I think that we should move to the closing oh, okay. of our seminar. Okay. But before saying goodbye, I would like to give the opportunity to each of our four presenters to have a final message of which will be the highlight that you would like each of the attendees will take home. Very briefly, and we will start with Mel. Thank you very much, Sophia. I think probably the highlight of the work that I presented is that international collaboration um, in terms of COVID-19 research in maternal, newborn and child health will really help us to answer some important questions going forward. And that's certainly one of the um, main objectives of the coalition and something that within our working group we deem to be very important. Um, and that's something that we really champion. And we would love to hear from researchers around the world, particularly those who have attended this webinar, um, who would like to share their work with us. And if there's any way that we as a working group can contribute or help, we would love to hear, hear from you and would love for you to, to email us. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Doc, Professor Kumar, I'm not sure if Kate is on, but Professor Kumar and then we'll continue. Yeah, so basically I think in the first way we were all very scared what will happen to the babies and children and there was a lot of disruption of the normal care. But not what we have learned that uh, we don't need to be scared. Yes, newborn and children are affected, but outcomes are pretty good. And we need to focus on making sure they get the breastfeeding, they get the kangaroo mother care, they get the immunization, they get the nutritional support. I think that is going to save much more babies and children rather than the COVID is going to kill. So that's my message. Yeah. Thanks, Kumar. Um... Kate, uh, would you like to say a final word of which will be the take home message of what we presented? I'm not sure if Kate is able to hear us, so Maria Laura. Thank you. I would just like to add that I also believe that we can uh, present relevant information from under resource settings and those information will be key to understand the infection among pregnant and postpartum women 
which are at increased risk of severe disease. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Kate, are you available or not? She's having uh, internet problems. So uh, we have not, are you able to say a message, Kate? Well, maybe not in this opportunity. Um, we have now come to the end of this webinar where four experts provided an update of their research efforts related to the impact of the COVID-19 in maternal and child health. During the seminar, and we have good news, we have already received two applications to join the Maternal Neonatal and Children Working Group from Indonesia and Ethiopia. And we welcome more participants to get engaged with this collaborative initiative. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and for all the excellent questions. The link to the webinar recording will be published in the coalition website pretty soon. And when the webinar will close, you will be directed to a brief survey. Your feedback on this webinar is very valuable and much appreciated. And we, thought, we hope to see you at future coalition events and thank you all. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, all of you. Bye.